the most unusual kings in the Bible. Number 1. Zimri, the king that only lasted a week. In times past, stories were told by the flickering light of campfires. The very word king carried a weight unlike any other. There were times when kingdoms rose and fell, and the stories of kings held a mystique that captivated our imagination. Yet, among the many rulers of antiquity, the kings of ancient Israel stand out, not merely as political figures, but as characters woven into the spiritual fabric of a people's destiny. In a land surrounded by mighty empires, where the concept of kingship was both a symbol of divine favor and earthly power, the monarchs of Israel played roles that were both intricate and profound. In the Bible, there are two different people who both go by the name Zimri. Zimri is a prince mentioned in Numbers chapter 25 verse 14. He was the son of Selu. There is no further information provided on this Zimri. The second Zimri, about whom we have more information, went on to become the fifth king of the northern kingdom of Israel and reigned at the time that Asa ruled over the southern kingdom of Judah. Zimri's ascension to the throne, his brief reign of seven days, and the manner in which he passed away before the subsequent monarch could murder him, are all described in 1 Kings chapter 16. During the time when King Baasha of Israel was in power, the Lord spoke through a prophet and sent his message. The Lord was angry with Baasha for the way he had led Israel into sin. God told him calamity awaited him. 1 Kings chapter 16 verses 3 through 4. Behold, I am going to burn Baasha and his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Anyone belonging to Baasha who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. And anyone belonging to him who dies in the field, the birds of the sky will eat. After Baasha's death, his son Elah took the throne and followed in his father's evil ways. Elah's reign came to a sudden end when one of his military officials, Zimri, assassinated him after just two years. While Elah was drinking with his palace administrator, Azra, Zimri attacked. 1 Kings chapter 16 verses 8 through 10. In the 26th year of Asa king of Judah, Elah, the son of Baasha, became king over Israel at Tirzah and reigned for two years. And his servant Zimri, commander of half his chariots, conspired against him. Now Elah was in Tirzah drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, who was in charge of the household in Tirzah. Then Zimri came in and struck him and put him to death in the 27th year of Asa king of Judah, and he became king in his place. Zimri committed a heinous act by killing every member of Elah's family to secure his claim to the throne. However, unbeknownst to him, Zimri was actually carrying out God's judgment on Elah's father, Baasha. After eliminating Baasha's entire family, Zimri became the ruler of Israel and was convinced of his invincibility. His delusions were short-lived, as he was overthrown after only seven days of being in power. While Zimri was busy boasting about his coup from a city called Terzah, members of Israel's army discovered his treacherous actions. They were outraged and decided to appoint a new leader named Omri, who led the army against Zimri. 1 Kings chapter 16 verses 17 through 19. Then Omri, and all Israel with him, 
went up from Gibbethon and besieged Tirzah. When Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the king's house and burned the king's house over himself with fire and died. Because of his sins which he committed, doing evil in the sight of the Lord, walking in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin which he committed, misleading Israel into sin. Queen Jezebel used Zimri's name to mock Jehu after discovering that he was anointed to be the next king of Israel, replacing her husband Ahab. 2 Kings chapter 9 verse 31 She falsely compared Jehu's legitimate claim to the throne to Zimri's illegal seizure of power. However, her protest did not deter God, who brought about her unfortunate end. Jehu ordered her servants to throw her out of a window, and she fell to her death. Her body was then consumed by dogs. Zimri, the former king of Israel, was known for his treacherous ways. Despite Baasha and his son Elah's wickedness and their leading of Israel into sin, Zimri's actions were equally evil. He chose to take matters into his own hands instead of waiting for God's guidance. In the book of Daniel chapter 2 verse 21, it is stated that God is the one who appoints and removes kings. In fact, God personally selected Saul to be the first king of Israel, 1 Samuel chapter 10 verse 1, and also chose his successors. We can learn from the story of King Zimri that God will not honor our attempts to promote our own greatness. He will not bless selfish plans. While Zimri demanded the throne, David patiently waited for God's plan to unfold, even though he had already been anointed as the next king of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 26 verse 9 David refused to harm the Lord's anointed, while Zimri had no regard for such things. David waited for God's timing to take the throne, and in doing so he was exalted by God. When we, like David, determine to wait on the Lord, he will exalt us in his time. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 But to those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him, will gain new strength and renew their power. They will lift up their wings and rise up close to God, like eagles rising toward the sun. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not grow tired. Number 2. Melchizedek, the Great King and Priest to be a king in biblical times was not just to wear a crown or sit on a throne. It was to be divinely chosen, a human link between the heavens and the earth. Imagine a time when kings were seen as gods by some and as direct representatives of the divine by others. In this intricate dance between the divine and the earthly, the kings of ancient Israel were not just rulers. They were carriers of a covenant, standard bearers of faith, and often the focal point of dramatic turns in history. From Solomon, whose wisdom became legendary, to David, a shepherd turned king who penned songs that still touch our souls, and to the enigmatic Ahab, whose complexities painted a portrait of both greatness and tragedy. Each king presents a story as intriguing as it is instructive. Even the name itself, Melchizedek, carries with it an air of mystery. He makes a quiet entrance into the canon of scripture. Our epic story begins with a man called Abraham. After a victorious battle, Abraham meets Melchizedek. 
Many of us are unfamiliar with how names operate in Hebrew and the Bible. Names in the Bible are not only descriptive, they also carry authority in them. For example, the name God gave to Adam meant of the earth. This described what Adam was produced from. A name can sometimes relate to the nominee's role in a biblical narrative, as in the case of Nabal, a foolish man whose name means fool. Names in the Bible can represent human hopes, divine revelations, or are used to illustrate prophecies. So, what does the name Melchizedek mean? The name Melchizedek has a significant meaning in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 2. And Abraham gave him a tenth of all the spoil. He is, first of all, by the translation of his name, King of Righteousness. And then he is also King of Salem, which means King of Peace. According to Genesis chapter 14 verse 18, Melchizedek served as king over Salem at one point. Genesis chapter 14 verse 18 Melchizedek king of Salem, ancient Jerusalem, brought out bread and wine for them. He was the priest of God Most High. The Bible mentions Salem four times. Three of these references are in conjunction with Melchizedek as its king. Jesus himself comes from the order of Melchizedek. Many times in the Old Testament, we see pictures of Jesus. Melchizedek is a key individual that reveals a lot of truth about Jesus. In the beginning, there were no Levitical priests. There was the order of Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God. Genesis chapter 14 verse 18 tells us that he was the priest of God Most High. According to the Holy Scriptures, there is only one God who was Most High. This title belonged to the God who Abraham worshipped. He alone ruled over all gods and was the one to whom all gods were to bow their knees. He has dominion over both the heavens and the earth. This title could not properly be given to any other in the universe. Melchizedek worshipped the God of Abraham. The Bible does not provide any information about how Melchizedek first became acquainted with the God that Abraham served. To be a king and a priest is an extremely rare thing. The priesthood that Melchizedek held came before the priesthood that Aaron and the Levites held. The order and mystery of Melchizedek is used to explain Jesus. The man that had no beginning and no end. The interesting insight into Melchizedek is that he has never given a beginning or an end. David reveals to us that the Lord Jesus has been appointed as a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, his priesthood will never end. This priesthood of Melchizedek was a priesthood that would continue until the end of time. Those who were hopelessly lost in their sins would receive spiritual healing through this priesthood and those who were crushed under the weight of their shame would find forgiveness. Melchizedek in the New Testament The first reference to Melchizedek in the New Testament is in Hebrews chapter 5 verses 1 through 10. This chapter draws comparisons between the priesthood of the Old Testament and the priesthood that the Lord Jesus holds now. The author begins by providing some background information about the priesthood in the Old Testament, including its responsibilities and requirements. It is easy to see why the priesthood of Jesus was difficult for early Jewish Christians to grasp. Jesus was not from the lineage of Aaron. 
just as Melchizedek was a mystery to many. Jesus' resurrection demonstrated that he was not a priest like Aaron, who had to atone for his own sin first. Jesus was vindicated as the Holy One of the Father as a result of his resurrection. Jesus was able to bear the wrath that sinners deserved without falling into sin himself. Jesus, as a priest in the order of Melchizedek, was able to empathize with our suffering. The anguish that Jesus experienced in the Garden of Gethsemane is evidence that he wrestled with the challenge of obedience. But despite this, his obedience was flawless. Because Jesus went through suffering on our behalf and then rose from the dead afterward, he is uniquely qualified to be the author of our salvation. There is no room for doubt regarding the high priesthood of Jesus Christ. The priesthood that Jesus exercised was not the same as that of the Israelites. It existed before the time of Israel and the law. Melchizedek, and not Aaron, is the one to whom the lineage of Jesus' priesthood can be traced back. Abraham is considered to be the father of the Israelites. The people of God held him in high regard because of his role. In spite of this, Abraham submitted to Melchizedek's authority and gave him a tenth of the plunder from the battle. As great as Abraham was, he bowed the knee to Melchizedek. One tenth of the grain, vineyards, and flocks went to the king. As a result of this fact, some interpreters have drawn the conclusion that Abraham acknowledged Melchizedek to be the legitimate ruler of Salem. Possibly Abraham gave this tithe to Melchizedek as a priest. By doing so, he was able to express his gratitude to the Lord for the victory that he had bestowed upon him through the offering of his gift. Melchizedek could have taken this resource as both a king and a priest. What is vital for us to note here is that Abraham recognized Melchizedek as the righteous king and priest of Salem. God had a plan for the Lord Jesus to be high priest of this order reigning as king of righteousness in a city of peace. Abraham, in his capacity as a representation of the priesthood of Levi, bowed before Melchizedek, who was a representative of the Lord Jesus. Abraham also gave Melchizedek a tithe. There would eventually be two separate priesthoods. One would be attended upon by regular mortals. The other, would be eternal and involve a priest who did not have a beginning or an end to his existence. The temporary priesthood would eventually give way to the eternal priesthood and the high priest of the order of Melchizedek would reign forever, ministering to the needs of his people. A better priesthood. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 11. So if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it the people received the law, what further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be designated according to the order of Aaron? We are unable to serve God and fulfill all of his criteria without making errors. In our actions, our words, and our thoughts, we frequently fall short of the ideal that he has set. More significantly, we were born in sin, and as a result, every single one of our deeds is polluted with the rottenness of that sin. These countless sacrifices did not resolve the problem of sin and our broken relationship with God. Temporary relief was experienced, but the underlying problem was not addressed. Number three, the wisest king in the Bible. Solomon succeeded King Saul and King David as the third and final king of the unified nation of Israel. 
He was the son of David and Bathsheba, the former wife of Uriah the Hittite, whom David had slain to cover up his infidelity with Bathsheba while her husband was fighting in the war. Solomon penned the Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and a large portion of Proverbs. Solomon reigned for 40 years. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 1 Solomon undoubtedly felt the burden of ruling over God's people. The king made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, early in his reign by marrying his daughter. This action demonstrated Solomon's willingness to use marriage as a political tool, and he would eventually take polygamy and foreign marriages to dizzying heights. God tolerated polygamy among his people in the Old Testament, but it always cost them because it was against his will. The king's behavior would exact a terrible price, not only on Solomon, but on the entire nation of Israel. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. 1 Kings chapter 3 verses 2 through 3 At the time, the Israelites were sacrificing on the high places, a pagan practice learned from their Canaanite neighbors that was against Mosaic law. Despite this, Solomon loved the Lord by following his father David's statutes. Solomon famously asked the Lord for wisdom at Gibeon, the most famous high place. God began the proceedings by appearing to Solomon and making an incredible offer. What should I give you? Solomon's response demonstrated that in some ways he was wise beyond his years. When he became king, he was about 20 years old. The young man was aware of his shortcomings. He had no prior leadership experience, but he had been appointed ruler of a large number of people. What he required was a receptive heart in order to judge and lead them correctly. Realizing your desperate need for God is the first step toward becoming a kingdom man. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, 